Right, uh, good morning everyone. Well, I'm going to be speaking today. Um, so, for those of you who have been, been around for the last few weeks, um, this is a kind of, I guess, the third time uh, that I want to talk about these three words that we've been looking at, um, which is humility, being humble, um, hunger, being hungry, and this morning, um, I want to talk about uh, holiness, um, being holy, which is a, um, it's really exciting to talk about it, but it's also uh, quite terrifying when you see uh, some of the stuff in the Old Testament. You know, God's holiness is uh, something not to be trifled with. Uh, Just a minute, I didn't, not yet, not yet. (laughs) you know, we serve a holy God. Uh, the Bible um, talks about God being holy, holy, holy. That's the kind of number one defining attribute of God. And um, I guess often we can think about the word holy, holiness, and sometimes maybe not realize what it is. You know, we talk about having a holy day or a holiday. Uh, our parents have gone to the Holy Land. We read the Holy Bible, Um, we serve the Holy One, and I guess you can probably find other examples of the word holy. So it's used a lot in the Bible. Holy, what does it mean? Um, God calls us to be holy like him. If I can get Leviticus, uh, Leviticus 14, I think it is. Let me just, I've got too many notes this morning. Um, It's Leviticus 11. Sorry, Leviticus 11, uh, verse 44 um, and 45. Here we go. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Um, And then it talks, I mean, this is from a section talking about what you can and can't eat uh, and various things like that. And basically don't eat bugs, it says, (laughs) that crawl along the ground. Um, And then I think in Leviticus again, chapter 19, verse 2, if we could just uh, read that. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And third and final, Leviticus 20, 26, verse 26. And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So three times in Leviticus, you know, one of the books of the law, uh, God commands the Israelites to be holy. And in that last one, it says, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples. Being holy is about being set apart separated, called out, different, unique, distinct from something else. So God himself, there is no one like God. No one comes close. He can't be categorized alongside anyone else. He is unique. And as it says in Revelation, he is holy, holy, holy. There's no one like him. You know, when we go for job interviews or if you've ever recruited uh, someone, you're looking or when you're applying for a job, you're looking to set yourself apart so you stand out from the rest of the crowd so that you get that job. And when you're recruiting, you're looking for the person, the standout candidate, the person who's set apart from all the others. And so you're looking for someone holy, you know, or you're looking to be a holy person when you're, getting, uh, when you're going for a job. You're looking to stand out, be separate from everyone else. And be distinct. And uh, I mean, this this theme of being holy because God is holy continues into the New Testament. If we can go to uh, one Peter or First Peter, as you should say it, I think First Peter, chapter one. I believe it's chapter one. No. Mm-hmm. 
There you go. Uh, Verse 13. We'll read a big section. It says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform. There we go. We've got separation already. Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written... Be holy because I am holy. So he's quoting Leviticus there. It says, uh, Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. You know, this world will seem more and more strange to us, especially as Christians, as followers of Jesus. We, it will seem strange and we will feel like strangers because we are called to be holy, to be separate, to be different. Um, for you know that it, is, it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And so we've been born... As it says, not of imperishable, but through the living and enduring word of God. And so we will stand forever with God. So straight away, when we're born again, we become holy. We're separated. We've said goodbye to our old life. We've uh, been born uh, again with God's spirit to live lives that are different, to live lives that are holy, to lives that are set apart from the rest of the world. And, who's, and because of that, we will stand forever with him because we're not born of imperishable stuff like flowers of the field. So, yeah. Um, so, what, if we can go back to the slides. Um, so, holy means to be set apart. If we can go to the next slide, Adam, please. So, what being holy is not, you know. Uh, let's get an example of a holy person stereotypical holy person may be the kind of person that uh, someone outside of the church thinks is holy so a holy person gives lots of money to charity you know christian charities of course uh, a holy person only listens to christian music um, they may dress like a nun or a monk or they may uh, wear clothes that they've made themselves Maybe, even if they're feeling really holy, they'll have made them, donated them to a charity shop, and then bought them back, and then worn them. Um, apologies if any of this is true. I don't, I'm not, I don't want to offend. I just, um, I just kind of look at, I'm trying to draw out what holiness is not. It says children have biblical names, you know, and they only watch Veggie Tales. Uh, the holy people are at church every single Sunday, every single prayer meeting every single work party um they drive electric cars because they care for the environment they recycle they only flush the toilet as and when necessary to save water because they love the god's uh, creation so much uh they pray and fast seven times a day um they own a really large leather-bound bible maybe never uh touched drugs or alcohol they watch tbn that's the only channel that's on. They do, never swear. They wear a big cross around their neck. Um, they might post Bible verses on social media. Um, all, none of this, you know, some of these things are really good, by the way. It's just sometimes we can misunderstand what holiness is. If you're uh, maybe of the younger generation or the more tech-savvy generation, you might have the Bible app pinned not just on the first page of your phone, but it might even be right at the bottom on the kind of your four that never move. Um, They'll have Bible verses as your wallpaper, you know. Maybe they're so holy that they only shake hands 
when they meet someone of the opposite sex. Uh, they deny themselves all, anything and everything and kind of live this kind of sterile life. So is that holiness? I mean, there's some really good things on there. You know, we should, a lot of the things are positive things, but that's not what holiness is. You know, you might think, oh, that's a holy person, you know. Uh, for those of you that maybe are, aren't too holy, you might watch The Simpsons. <laughs> and you know, there's a guy, Ned Flanders, and I guess that's the world's view of a holy person. But that's so far from the truth. What is it that makes us holy? You know, I was talking about the coronavirus and, uh, you know, the world has gone mad buying alcohol gel. Um, did anyone manage to get any? <laughs> um, because they, there's a virus, isn't there, going around and, you know, there's the fear for people who, I guess as Christians, it's like when we live, we live for Jesus. If we die, we go to be with him. And so there's no fear. But there is real fear out there and people are buying all this gel because they are worried that they might catch the virus. But the Bible's very clear. Every human is infected with a disease called rebellion and sin. But you don't see people running around like crazy. But they will, because the Bible clearly diagnoses them with a severe case of sin and rebellion. And, but we know the cure. You know, the cure is the precious blood of Jesus Christ who gave his life to be uh, the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice for all our sin, so that we could be declared righteous, declared holy, um, and live the life that God intended us to be, live forever with Jesus, be reunited with him. And so the, the things that I've listed are kind of behavioral holiness. Let's look at an example. If we go to Mark chapter 10, verse 17, I believe it's from, let's look at someone who was holy, maybe a bit like the person who I've just listed uh, or described. Uh, chapter... 10 verse 17 and you probably know this it's the rich young ruler or the rich young man it says as Jesus started on his way a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him good teacher he asked what must I do to inherit eternal life why do you call me good Jesus answered no one is good except God alone you know the commandments so this is what Jesus is saying do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. So Jesus, his doctor, uh, Jesus being the doctor, diagnosing him. You know, he's basically going to the doctor. You know, you could see this guy going, what must I do to get this eternal life? I'm dying. I need to know what, what I need to do. What's wrong with me? Give me the medicine. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. That's important. We should love people. Uh, one thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Um, the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. If he says something twice, it's important. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And so Jesus diagnosed this man's problem. Outwardly, I guess behaviorally, he was holy. But holiness isn't about our behavior. Just as much as coronavirus and whatever virus isn't about the symptoms. You know, you don't say this person is ill because they've got a cough. This person is ill because they've got a fever. No, those are just symptoms of the real problem. They've got a virus. And this person's real problem is not a behavioral problem it's actually much deeper than that it's where his heart is his heart what's the number one thing in his heart what's what has his affections you know what is it that he loves the most and it's very clear his face 
you know, Jesus doesn't call everyone to sell everything and give to the poor, but he does demand that our number one affection is for God. And in this case, this rich young ruler, his number one affection was his wealth. Despite outwardly and behaviorally being, you know, as holy as I guess in those days, he, you know, he was holy. Um, but Jesus sees his heart. He looks at the heart. You know, the Bible talks about that God looks at the heart. Men look at the outward appearance. And sometimes, you know, you can appear to be holy. Your children, our children might appear to be holy. But God looks at the heart. And Jesus cut straight through all of that and spoke directly to this young man's heart. And I think, you know, uh, Bible scholars think that this eventually this man turned around and actually then gave um, his wealth to the poor. And as Jesus says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And so it doesn't matter what your heart might be you know, what might be number one in your heart. Maybe there are things in your life that get in the way of God, but nothing can stop God. If you surrender to him, if you open your lives to him, he can make a way where with men it might seem impossible. Um, so a holy person, holiness is all about the heart. It's about, it's about who, who or what we love. Um, you know, outwardly he kept the law of Moses, but inwardly his heart was far away from God. So the question is, what are our greatest affections? You know, I'm sure many of you probably had a similar experience. Um, but, you know, when I, I guess, met Grace, um, you, know, uh, I, you know, I saw her for the first time. The first time I spoke to her, I thought, oh, she's really beautiful. She's really pretty. Um, and then... You know, as I got to opportunities to spend time with her, I guess, you know, the whole humble, hungry, and holy thing, uh, as I was humble enough to risk asking her out, because <laughs> asking someone out, I guess, is a humble thing, because um, if you do it in the right way, that is, <laughs> um, because you can actually get rejected really badly, can't you? You know, putting yourself out there for someone with the opportunity to get rejected is a humble thing. We see that with Jesus himself. He came to the earth, put himself out there more than I did. I mean, you know, if, if I'd been rejected, it would have been my, I don't know, ego or pride that might have been hurt. Jesus himself put himself on, on the cross for us, at knowing full well that we might reject him. And some people do, some people have. But he did it anyway because he was humble. And, you know, you might have been humble enough to risk, taking a risk in a relationship. And uh, it was as I spent, you know, spent time with Grace. Uh, you know, I was hungry. You know, I'd want to try and make every opportunity to, uh, um, I don't know, go for coffee or what did I do in my student days? A milkshake or something. Um, you know, I was desperate. I was hungry to learn more about her. And as I learned more about her and... Um, I guess my heart kind of was aligned to seeking her. And it's the same with God. You know, we, we need to be humble to come before him, to realize that we haven't got everything right. <laughs> We've probably got a lot wrong, but we go to God. And then as we spend time, as we, you know, spend time with his, his saints, we spend time listening to the word, reading the word. As we spend time in worship, we learn what he's like. We learn more about him. And then we fall in love with Jesus because we realize just how desperately we need him. And not only how desperately we need him, how amazing uh, the gift that he offers us, how amazing he is as a person, uh, and we discover all that and we fall in love. And that love that we fall into with Jesus is the thing, is holiness. You know, it's not the outward symptoms. It's the thing inside us that determines what we do that is holiness. We can only be holy when we're in love with God, when he is our number one, when he is the affection of our hearts. And, you know, it says, Jesus says himself, 
if you love me, you will obey my commands. Now, that's not to be read, obey my commands, and then I'll love you, or prove that you love me by obeying my commands. It's actually, if you love me, the most natural thing to happen is for you to obey my commands. And those are the symptoms of being in love with God. Holiness is being in love with God. Our hearts seek to be with him, to spend time in his presence, to uh, receive, I guess, the, the wonderful, amazing um, delight. You know, the, the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in God, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And when you do that, your lives become holy, and people recognize it. People recognize it. Some people recognize it and are drawn to it. Some people recognize holiness, and because they don't want anything to do with God, they reject God, they're drawn away from it. And because we are strangers in this world, if we are living holy lives where we're in love with God, there will be blessings of saints that are also in love with God, that are put him first as their number one affection. Um, but there will also be opposition. You know, don't be surprised that there will be opposition. Jesus himself had people who were drawn to him. Crowds were drawn to him. But equally, crowds chanted to crucify him. Um, so what are our greatest affections? Some of the things that can take the place of God and cause us to become unholy. Money, as Jesus said, it's so hard for us as humans to be able to, it's impossible You know, when money is our God, to then love God as well. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. Um, The world's gone mad in terms of sex. They've made that God. And you see all the confusion and chaos and um, perversions that come uh, from the world making that their God. The thing that they pursue is number one, power. We see abuses of power. We see people craving power. Um... Signs and wonders. You know, sometimes Christians can fall into the trap of chasing after miracles and signs and wonders. Those things aren't the things that we chase after. And if you chase after those signs and wonders, you won't encounter God. You will encounter Satan. But actually, if you chase after God, signs and wonders will follow us. So don't make signs and wonders and miracles your number one affection. Prestige. Are we more important? Are we more concerned? Is, are our hearts concerned about how we, how we look? Or how we are looked? Uh, how we are, what's the word? Uh, how we are perceived by others? Are we more concerned about how we look? How we dress? Are we more concerned about our children? Now, even good things, if they take the place in our heart, if they become our number one affection, they can become bad things when they take the place of God. Are we more concerned about how our children um, are perceived by others? Are we more concerned about our spouse? Now, these things aren't either or. You can serve God by serving your children and bringing them up in the Lord. You can serve God by loving your spouse. Um, But number one should always be God. Uh, Our careers, or our careers, you know, are they the thing that drives us the most? Uh, house holidays do we live to go on holiday is that the number one thing in our life are we looking to that to give us the thing that uh, only God can give us so who should be our greatest affection obviously Jesus now it's not easy especially if you are not a Christian if you've never known God it's not possible humanly to put God's number one to make him uh, our, the affection of our heart. Our hearts don't do that. You know, um, we have to be born again. We have to allow ourselves, our flesh, our old lives to die. That's why we have baptism. We're showing, declaring that our old life has passed away. We are crucifying our fleshly life and actually being born again, raised up in a new life, given to us by God and living with his spirit in our lives to give us the power to live a holy life because we can't do it on our own we can't love God Um, you know there's the the law in the Old Testament 
actually, we can go to Genesis. You know, the law is good. Jesus came, he said, you know, the law is good. I mean, Paul talks about, in Romans, he talks about how, you know, is the law bad? That the law caused people to sin? No, the law is good. And the very first law given to humans was you can eat from any tree apart from the tree of, uh, what is it? Good and evil, knowledge of good and evil. Um, or were there two, I think there were two trees, weren't there? Um, I always forget that. Um, but basically, God gave us everything and gave us one rule. <laughs> one rule. And what did our um, forefather and mother, Adam and Eve, what did they do? As soon as there was a law that God set, a perfect law that God set, what did we do? We rebelled. Um, let's find it. Uh, where is it? Chapter 3. Well, actually, before that, where does he, where does he give the, uh, the rule? Is it in chapter 3? Ah, there we go. Chapter 2, yeah. Verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. There we go. One rule. And by, in the next few verses, chapter 3, if we can go to there, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, so he starts sowing seeds of doubt. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. And here's the, uh, the thing. It says, the chapter four, verse 4, you will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so then this is where she stopped trusting God. She's doubting God. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was very much implicated in this, who was with her, and he ate it. And, uh, yeah, the law that God gave them, they broke straight away, pretty much. I mean, I don't know how much time passed, but in the Bible, that's pretty much straight away. They broke it. Moses gave the Israelites a lot of laws, hundreds of laws. And did the law um, save them? No, the law brought, showed them. It, the law was an act of God's grace and mercy. Because what the law of Moses does is shows us that we are incapable of pleasing God in our own strength we are incapable of obeying the law we can't do it on our own it point the whole of the law of Moses points us to the need for Jesus our perfect sacrifice our savior that's what it does the law is is and Jesus came to fulfill it because he uh, obeyed every single law um, and so the law of Moses uh, wasn't there to try and give us salvation. Well, it was there to show us. It was an act of God, an act, a gracious act of God, a merciful act of God to show us that we need Jesus, to point us to Jesus. It was almost the, 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 it's the diagnosis. It proves to every human that we are in dire need of a Savior, that we have the virus, the disease of sin and rebellion, and we need Jesus desperately. We're, and we, nothing else uh, can save us. And so, yeah, holiness is the outworking of love for God. Trusting God, loving God. Uh, just as I guess, you know, in the Bible, good works are the outworking of faith. You know, you can't have faith on its own. Faith without deeds, without works is dead, Paul says in Romans. Um, similarly, you can't be holy without love for God and uh, let me just find this so how do we as a be holy as a church if we can go to Ephesians 5 27 this is what we should be like it says we're going to be a radiant church presented to Jesus his bride 
without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. And he himself is going to make us holy. Um, holiness as a church will set us at odds with the world. I've already said that. If you obey the Bible, if you decide that actually God's wrong, the Bible's wrong, then yeah, you can be friends with the world. The world will accept you. But if you believe the Bible, if you obey the Bible, if you believe God meant what he said in the Bible, then it will set us at odds with the world. That doesn't mean that we have to put up unnecessary barriers, but we need to remain distinct. So we need to be the salt of the earth. I think I've preached that before, but we need to be distinct. If we lose our saltiness, all we're good for is being trampled on and thrown out. So we need to be distinct. We will face opposition. Um, Our message, the gospel, is distinct. There's no other message like the gospel of Jesus Christ. No other message of grace. Every other um, of the major world religions are about works, about earning uh, your kind of God's favor. We can't do that. It's all about Jesus. It's all about grace. Jesus says uh, that the world will know that we are his disciples by our love for each other. Our love in the church for each other, our unity needs to be distinct, needs to be holy, needs to be different to the, what the rest of the world has to offer. Our community is distinct. In, in God's family, there's no, you know, people of different ethnicities, different class, different generations, different language, different looks, uh, different whatever, you know, can actually all be one in Jesus. There's no other place in the world that's like that. We need to be, you know, not have any, I guess the Bible says, you know, there's no, neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, um, lots of other things and actually our community needs to be distinct to the world we shouldn't just be like every other i guess social group or gathering or club or or body of people we need to be distinct a key ingredient is forgiveness humility a lack of selfish ambition our marriages need to be distinct from marriages in the world you know sadly it's not always the case But with God's help, with God's spirit, we can. Our marriages need to be loving, submissive, life-giving. Parenting. Our parenting needs to be distinct, not just like the rest of the world. There will be things that the world says is bad, but actually God's word says is good. Our parenting needs to be good so that when our kids go to school, not they don't necessarily have to be the, the brightest or top of the class, but they need to be leaders. Leaders that are compassionate and kind to other children. They need to be helpful. They need to be obedient. They need to be, um, they need to stand out. They need to be set apart. They need to be people that, yes, stand out from the crowd. That are known for their wisdom. That are known for their uh, generosity. That are known for their care, for their love. You know, when there's children at school that are hurting or that are um, maybe hurting others, that they're a a voice that come in and and bring comfort, bring healing, bring encouragement. And we can't do any of this without God's grace. By God's grace, he gives us his Holy Spirit. When Jesus uh, returned back to heaven, he sent us uh, the Holy Spirit to be a helper. And he said he's with us even to the end of the age. And by God's grace, he's given us the Holy Spirit so that we can be holy. Um, I just want to go to the third slide on my PowerPoint. Because these three things, they're not just do these steps, one, two, three, and you'll be done. We need to be constantly making sure that we have an attitude, a spirit of humility that causes us not to be satisfied with where we are, not to think we know everything now, now we can just look down at people and tell other people what to do. We need a a constant spirit of humility that causes us to be hungry to learn more, to learn more about God, to learn more about his character, to learn more about others, so that we can actually never fall out of love with God. You know, uh, people say that, you know, 
you know, people that, I guess, end relationships say, oh, we just fell out of love. But that's never the case. The first thing you do is you fall out of repentance. You fall out of humility. Pride enters into a relationship. And suddenly, that relationship is fractured. Because instead of being repentant, we think we're right. We think we're, we've got all the answers. And that's not a good relation. That's not good for any human relationship. It's certainly not good for our relationship with God. And so we always want to maintain our spiritual fervor, our love for God, through humility first and foremost, through desperately seeking Him, through um, the outworking of a love for God. You know, people will see our holy lives when we're truly in love with God. And if we ever think that we know everything, this is Satan's mistake. You know, he lost his... Uh, humility, pride built up. He thought he knew better than God. He thought he, he could do a better job or he wanted some of what belonged to God. He became hungry for the wrong things. Instead of becoming hungry for God, he became hungry for the worship that was due to God and only God. And as a result, he became the complete opposite of holy. He became completely evil, was cast down, uh, with a third of the angels and uh, you see the outworking of that heart that is completely against anything and everything that God stands for and you see the destruction that it brings on humans in the world but God is so much greater than that and he came to make all things new and put everything right and de defeat Satan once and for all and we know the end that's the good thing about the Bible is we know the end and all you know all these fears about viruses and things like that we don't have to worry because obviously we, we've got Jesus we've got us his salvation we know that things are going to probably get even worse um, because the Bible tells us that you know terrible things are yet to come and yet we don't have to be afraid we don't have to be anxious because we know the end we know who wins and we're on his side and he is very much on your side so I just want to finish there um, I don't think I've got anything more to say but that actually if there's anything that ever gets in the way of us loving God often that's sin you know confess our sin you know, find someone who you can trust um, who is who is equally humble who isn't going to like look down on you who isn't going to gossip about you but who's going to actually love you and, um, yeah, be, be Jesus' hands and feet and, and allow you to confess the things that you've done wrong so that Jesus can come in, the Holy Spirit can come in and make you holy, give you a new heart, a heart that longs after God. You know, we are, you know, Jesus, we sing these songs, you know, Jesus, lover of my soul, and that is so true. And we want to love him back because, yeah, that, I mean, that's the, the, I guess the most, the Bible uses the analogy or the um, metaphor of, of uh, you know, in the Song of Songs, that um, our relationship with, with Jesus is like one of lovers that are longing for each other. And Jesus longs to be with us, longs to enter into a relationship with you, longs uh, to make you more like him, to make you holy. He longs for that. Um, and so if there's anything that gets in the way root it out uh, get rid of it um, you know humble yourself it says in the Bible if you humble yourself before God he gives us more grace and then more grace and we always need his grace grace being the thing grace being the thing we don't deserve as human beings we don't deserve God's love no one deserves God's love but because of his grace he gives it to us we don't earn it we don't earn it through holy acts or trying to be holy or acting holy. We earn it through a relationship with Jesus. Being humble enough to ask him into our lives, to teach him, to feed us, to make him like him. And that's what my prayer is for us as a church family, that we would be holy as God is holy. Um, I'm going to pray and, uh, and then I'm going to close. Father, thank you.
that you are a holy God. You are holy, holy, holy. Father, help us to come before you with trembling. With hearts that are humble, that don't presume anything. Come before you just looking to you for everything that we need. Thank you that you give us everything we need. Thank you that we don't live by bread alone, but we live by every word that comes through you. Thank you that you speak words of life over us. Thank you that you intercede for us. Thank you that you died on that cross, you went back to heaven, and you plead for us. Thank you that as we sang, that you ever plead for us. That in Christ alone, our hope is found. That nothing else, not riches, not prestige, not family, not wealth, not uh, our intellect, not our wisdom, not our looks, not our lack or our, our plenty, but thank you that it's in Christ alone, you alone, that we are made holy, that we are declared righteous, that we can enter into a relationship with you. Father, thank you that you cleansed us. Thank you that you cleansed us not by alcohol gel or antibacterial soap, Father, but you cleansed us by your blood, that you wiped away, washed away every stain of sin and rebellion, and you gave us robes of righteousness, brighter than snow. Father, that we can be with you forever. When we leave this earth, Father, when our work here is done, when you call us home, thank you that we can live with you forever in joy. Thank you that in your holiness there is endless joy, that there is everlasting joy, that there are countless pleasures. Father, that there is just inexpressible happiness in your holiness. Father, thank you that despite our rebellion, despite our rejection, of you you died you chased us down you came you gave yourself for us you call us to receive you father for anyone here that doesn't know you father i pray that they would call out to you that they would humble their lives before you that they would realize their need for you the need for your blood that washes away every sin (laughs) father i pray that you would cause us as a church as a family of believers as your children to become holy, to be known as a holy people, a royal priesthood, a chosen people, set apart to live for you. Father, I thank you that you call us to live for the purpose that you created us, to worship you, to glorify you, to enjoy you. Father, that we would do that. Father, that anything that any spirit of religion or, or pride that seeks to try and Uh, pretend father to try and counterfeit your holiness father we 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 ask you to just cast it out father to be rid of it father let us be heart let us live lives that are pure that are devoted to you father thank you that you look at the heart thank you that you don't look at the outward thank you that we can't fool you we can't um deceive you father thank you that you you look at our hearts you know our every thought you know our every deed you know everything you know our fears you know our hopes you know our dreams you know our weaknesses you know our strengths you know every hair on our head if we've still got hair father thank you that you're a good god that loves us i pray that you would cause us to be a, a holy people pray that where our love maybe for you has grown weak or dim or uh, father pray that you would reignite that flame of passion for you that every that the number one thing that our heart is for is you father where the things that get in the way make us let us take practical steps to remove every barrier from a relationship with you practical steps to to destroy anything that comes in the way of a relationship with you Father, thank you that you, are, you, you love us and you want to see us cleansed. We want to see us live lives that enjoy you, that are attractive to the world. Father, we pray for <clears throat> that you would draw people to us, draw people that are hungry for you, that are humble, that know their need for you, that there's something missing in their life, that this world has, doesn't have what they're seeking. Father, I pray that you'd you'd use us to share your holiness. 
with others, to share your love, a love for you with others. In Jesus' name, amen.